Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, December the 25th, 2021. It is currently 10.03 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. I almost forgot where I was. Now, good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. And Merry Christmas to everyone. Yes, it is Christmas. It is December the 25th. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I know the chances are there are very few people listening to me live right now, but that's perfectly okay. Hopefully, when you do listen to this, you'll find this to be very beneficial and hopefully very helpful as we move past Christmas. I know I know it's still Christmas Day. I know it's still Christmas Day. But as we move past Christmas, we'll fast. I mean, before we even know it, we're going to We're going to just open our eyes and we're going to be looking at a brand new year. It will no longer be 2021. It will be 2022. And once we get to the brand new year, well, hopefully this will be very helpful in giving you something to consider as you enter into that new year, something that hopefully will be very beneficial to you, spiritually speaking. All right. So here here is the setting. Yes, I'm here in the an empty church. All around the church, it's like just silent. It is quiet. There's very few cars on the road. When I was driving here, there was very few cars. It is it is a beautiful day here in West Texas. It's in the 60s right now. I think it's supposed to get into the 80s. Uh, very, I don't think there's a cloud in the sky. It's just I got here to the church and I opened the front door of the church and just I just sat here for a few minutes, going, "Whoa, it, it's so quiet and." Okay, it's it's Christmas. I'm here in an empty church by myself. Okay, and I just started thinking about things. If I don't lose my voice here already, um, I just started thinking about things, and I'm like, okay, so what can I do today? What what can I do sitting in this empty church in front of a microphone? What could I do that would really benefit people not only today but spe- and again f- uh, focusing on this idea? of before we know it, we're going to be in 2022. We're going to be looking at a brand new year. What could I possibly discuss that would be beneficial? And I, I, I kind of contemplated that for a few minutes. I kind of I kind of thought about that. And then I kind of just forgot about it. Opened my Bible and said, okay, well, it is Christmas Day. And we have been spending all week in Luke chapter 2 for our Bible study exercise. And my sermon last night to the church, based off Luke chapter 2. So I just grabbed my Bible, Luke chapter 2, and I started reading the story, uh, the, the narrative again, Luke chapter 2. So let's just start there. And I'll, when I get to the verse, that this one verse is what now, I mean, you can probably already tell from the title where I'm going with this, but that's okay. I'll just, I just want to walk you through it because I think it'll be important to see kind of what happened. So here I am, empty church. The front door of the church is open. It's a, it's a beautiful, quiet day around the church. It's Christmas Day. Of course, everyone's going on with their lives. They're busy. They're opening presents, spending time with family. Everyone's doing all of those things, all right? And as that's going on, I'm sitting here reading Luke chapter 2. Let's begin. Verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For, un, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, as I was sitting here, again, empty sanctuary, Christmas Day, and I read that verse. I've read that verse a million times. I've probably, I've done, I've done teaching on the verse. So it, again, it wasn't like it was a brand new thing, but it just really hit me today again, over again, because I've been, I, this verse has had massive impact on me at different times in my Christian life. But once again, 2021 December 25th, it it struck me one more time of the importance of pondering the things of God. Now, when I just read it this time, a second thing hit me that I did not even think about a few minutes ago when I was sitting here in the church. So I'm going to point out two things. I didn't even think about this, but now I, I think this will, I think this is very important. All right, so here we go. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. There's really two concepts here that I really want you to consider, and we're really going to try to dig into them. The fact that Mary kept all of those things and pondered them in her heart. She kept these things and pondered them in her heart. Those are very important concepts that I think is seriously lacking in the life of many Christians. It's seriously lacking in many churches. And I think it's something that we want to think about, maybe try to fix as we move into 2022. Now, just a few days ago, I did a podcast episode about the vanity of preaching right? That there are millions of sermons all over the internet, millions upon millions of sermons. There's Christian books. There's so much content to listen to. There's lots of preaching. But with all of this preaching, with all of the sermons, with a church all, you know, all over the United States of America, having services after services, sermon after sermon, there's small groups, there's Bible studies. With all of that going on, if you look at the state of the church, you look at the state of, of Christianity, you're like, you would, you would draw the conclusion from a human perspective, vanity of vanities, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Stop with all the sermons. Stop with all the Bible studies. It's not accomplishing anything. There would be a tendency to say that. And everyone tries to come up with, well, maybe if we change the way we preached, or maybe if we, everyone tries to come up with a solution to make it more effective to, to actually accomplish something. But maybe, just maybe, I'm just going to throw this concept out there. Maybe the problem isn't all the preaching. Maybe the problem isn't all the Bible studies. Maybe the problem isn't all the, the content available to everyone with, the, with their, just their phone, with millions of sermons. Maybe that there's all of this content going on, 
but there's very little keeping what we have heard and pondering what we have heard. Maybe there's lots of Bible reading, but there's nothing There's nothing going on with keeping those things and pondering those things. So I want to spend a little time at least introducing some concepts here this morning, and then maybe I will build on to this at a later time, all right? So, so this is really a this is really some some thinking that is that's not completely I haven't I haven't completely formulated all of my thoughts here. I just want to kind of introduce this and then we can come back and then work on this some more as we move closer and closer into 2022. But I, I just think it's very important to think of I mean I, everyone realizes that I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you can answer this for yourself. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you sometimes may start asking, so what, what really is, well, what are we really accomplishing? What are we really doing? It's church service, church service, Bible study, Bible study, small group, small group, activity, 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 activity. And then you look around, you're like, but marriages are falling apart. This is happening. This is going on. And it's just like, what, what's, what's wrong with, with this? Are we really doing anything? And I think maybe this verse gives us possible a, a possibility of some things that we that would greatly, if we could fix it, that it may change everything. I, I, you you can you can draw your own conclusions, but I think there's there's some principles here to consider. So I there's two parts again. Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. I'm going to focus on the pondering first, just briefly. Then we'll go to kept all of these things. And because I haven't done any work on the kept all of these things, I didn't even think about it until right now. But let's go with the a basic idea of pondered them in her heart. Pondered. That's, that's in fact, when I got ready to put the title down for this episode, I almost I put the pondering of the things of God. I didn't even like, I'm like, well, I, I could probably use a different word that would really get probably more, downloads and streams, but I'm going to use this word because it's right here in the text, this idea of pondering the things of God. So let's just start with that, the word pondered here, the word ponder or to ponder. Pondered, pondering, um, it, according to Merriam-Webster means this, to weigh in the mind to appraise something. So, so you're, you're taking a concept, right? And you're weighing it in your mind. You're appraising it. You're, you're looking at it. All right. Let's go with another word or another definition. To ponder, to think about, to reflect on, to think or consider especially quietly, soberly, and deeply. To think or consider especially quietly, soberly and deeply. Mary took everything that she had encountered, everything, and she spent some time considering it quietly, soberly, and deeply. Now, I I do find it interesting, and maybe I don't want to read too much into the text, but it's interesting that it it doesn't here, at least in this place here. doesn't say anything about Joseph doing that, but that Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. That Mary was the one who was considering all everything that had happened, considering all the things that had occurred, all the words that she had heard, and that she was considering them quietly, soberly, and deeply. Now, I don't want to read too much into that, but I think there is a little bit of I think I think there's a possible lesson here. I think some people may have a natural inclination to take what they hear and to really ponder it, to think about it. Again, using the definition from Merriam-Webster, to consider things. They do so quietly. They do so soberly. They do so deeply. They take it. They think about it. They consider it. They, they, they give it much consideration. And there are others who their natural inclination is, hear it, okay, great, good sermon, and then move on. 
sadly, statistically speaking, the majority of people do not spend, they spend basically no time really considering in a quiet, soberly, and deep way, they don't really think or consider quietly, soberly, or deeply the things they hear preached. Because all of the statistics demonstrate that what a pastor preaches on Sunday morning, over half of the congregation has already forgotten it by Sunday night. And by Monday or Tuesday, that number is in the 70 to 80 percent percentile. That's that's where it is. Most of the people have completely forgotten. By the next week, when that pastor stands back behind that pulpit, like he preaches there Sunday, and by the next Sunday, looking at that congregation, probably 80 to 90 percent of those people have completely forgotten what was even preached. They may remember the text if you're lucky, if you've been like four years in the same book, maybe they'll remember where you are, but there's a good chance you start asking questions. Now, if they take notes, they may have the ability to open those notes, but if they did not have their notes and say, okay, what did we preach last Sunday? There's a high probability no one remembers. Now, I really want you to think of the the, the implications of that. If let's say 80% of your congregation, 80% of your church can't even remember what was preached seven days later, then really what, what is even the point? What, what, what's even the point of preaching other than to say, well, we're supposed to do it. So, hey, we, we did that thing we're supposed to do and everyone feels good about it. That, that is, a, that is sad, sad. Now, listen, if those people took that sermon, took the things of God that was proclaimed and gave it cons- deep, thoughtful, quiet, sober consideration, then the percentages of people who would remember it would be, I mean, the people who engage in that activity would remember what was preached, therefore making the preaching of God's word far more effectual, far more effective. From a human perspective, I understand we have the sovereign purpose of God and his preaching, what God hopes to accomplish. I understand all of that, but I'm saying from a purely human perspective, we we can just all agree that if people don't give the, the preaching and teaching of God's word any serious, deep consideration, it will be forgotten. We've, been, we've done a number of Bible study exercises. Obviously, I, don't, I think we're well into the hundreds now of episodes for the Bible study exercise here for the Theology Central podcast. It would be fascinating to find out all the people who've been participating in all of the Bible study exercises and just see how many they can even remember, what they can remember. Now, I hope that because the way the Bible study exercises are designed, it's supposed to try to lead people to quietly, soberly, and deeply consider the text. One text for an entire week, and we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. That's why I do the Bible study exercises the way I do them, is to try to fix this problem. And and, and I try to do the Bible study exercises so people are not passive listeners, but they're active participants, because by being an active participant, there's a far greater chance that you will actually remember what was studied for that particular week. That's one of the reasons I've, I've, I'm doing that for the Bible study exercises. But I, I think maybe we need to consider what it means to actually ponder the things of God. Let's do something else, all right? Let's go to, in fact, let's look at, uh, I'm going to look at Luke 2.19 and a number of uh, translations, all right? Okay. Uh, And I'm not going to read the whole verse. I'm just going to read the idea for pondering here, all right? The New International Version uses pondered them in her heart. They use the same word. The New Living Translation says, and thought about them often. To ponder in the heart is she thought, she took those things and thought about them often. If you, look, if, if the sermon is over and you don't think about it ever again, then how do you expect it to do anything in your life? ESV, pondered them in her heart. The Berean study Bible, pondered them in her heart. The Berean literal Bible, uh, pondering them in her heart. 
the King James pondered them in her heart. The new King James pondered them in her heart. Almost all the, almost all the translations use pondering. Almost all of them. But the Christian Standard Bible is one that changes it here. Meditating on them. Meditating on them. Now that 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 really gets us going in a in a very specific direction. But before we go there, let's just make sure that all of these translations saying pondering, what, why are they translating the Greek word pondering, and what can we can what can that mean? So we'll know what we'll do. We'll open up the Blue Letter Bible app. We'll go to Luke two nineteen. We'll tap on the verse for the Blue Letter Bible app. This will open up the interlinear, and we are going to be uh, introduced to this Greek word. Strong's G, 4820. Sumbalo. 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 I want Sumbalo. I want that Greek word, Sumbalo. I want that to be a very important word going into 2022. I know, I know it's Christmas Day. I know it's Christmas Day. And you're like, man, you're already jumping already to 2022. Well, I mean, it's going to be here before we know it. It's go- before you even know it, 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 we're going to be looking at a brand new year. So we need to start talking about it immediately. And this just, this brings in the Christmas story and the new year. It brings it all together. Mary started pondering these things right? Uh, there, the baby's laying in the manger, and she's pondering all of these. She's thinking deeply, quietly, soberly about all of these things. She's meditating on all of these things. If Sumbalo is the, is the Greek word here, and, and here's what we understand. It's used six times. One time trans, uh, translated ponder, one time make, one time confer, one time encounter, one time help, one time meet with us. Right? That, that's not super helpful there. The Strong's definition, to combine, that's interesting, and in speaking to converse, consult, dispute, mentally to consider, by implication to aid, personally to join, attack, confer, encounter, help, make, meet with, ponder. Right? That That's... A little, probably the most important thing here is the idea of to combine. Just, just keep that in mind. Thayer's Greek lexicon, um, to throw together, to bring together. All right. That, that, once again, it's putting something together. Now, if we go to the outline of biblical usage, this is what they have. To throw together, to bring together, to converse, to bring together together in one's mind, confer with one's self, to come together to meet, to bring together of one's property to contribute aid or help. So the idea is you take uh, the things you've heard, you then spend the time to put them together Right, you take all the things you've heard, you you put them together, and then you converse with yourself about them. In a sense, Mary was taking all the things that had occurred, everything that had happened, she was putting them together, and she was conversing with herself about these things. She was meditating on them, she was wondering about them, she was trying, what do they all mean? What we got, we got shepherds, we got this is good. Okay, what what is it what is going? She was trying to understand it all. Now, again, I just find it fascinating. I don't want to read too much into the text. It was Mary who was doing this. And if we go with the idea of pondering, really this idea of conversing with oneself, it was Mary having these deep thoughts within herself. It, it in other words, it doesn't even now I'm not saying she didn't have we we cannot know what she said or didn't say to Joseph. So I don't want to just throw, you know, Joseph under the bus here and make accusations about him that are not biblical. But I just find it interesting that here's Mary, and, and almost the text gives the idea that she's just, she's in thought with herself. She's conversing with herself. She's putting all of these thoughts together herself. And 
there are times that can be very frustrating as a Christian when you feel like, well, there's no one else to talk to about these things. That can be very frustrating, but make it very clear that even if you, even if you just have God's word and you have yourself and you're putting the things together and you're deeply considering these things and meditating on them, it's still beneficial. I know a lot of people, like, I know for me sometimes in my Christian life, I've grown frustrated that you, you, you can't find anybody else to want to have deep conversations and put the, the, word, the things of God's word together. That can be very frustrating. But don't let that ever dis- discourage you. You've got God's word. You just spend that time thinking about it. So in a sense, I was sitting here in an empty building on Christmas Day, just thinking, conversing with myself. I, For me, I cannot speak for others. I take this conversing with yourself thing, I take it very, very, very far, right? I will spend time in this church talking to myself. When I do Bible study, like I, the, 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 I, I, my favorite time of doing Bible study is really when there's no one in my house, right? Or, or there's no one here in the church because I will grab my notebook right here, have my notebook, and I will, I will have the text of scripture. I will think about it, read it. I'll start breaking it down. But as soon as I start breaking it down, I usually start walking and pacing and talking, right? And I'll be like, okay, so, all right, so I have this pa- passage in Peter, okay, all right, and I just start talking out loud to myself. I'll just, and to me, that's how I put it together. I have to talk it out to put it together. I have to really give it thought. Now, now let's be honest. Most of us listen to sermons, we listen to preaching, and we don't spend time talking it out, conversing, thinking deeply about it. Now, we may, and I've, and I've fallen victim to this, as, uh, especially as a younger Christian, is that I have had a tendency to listen to preaching and talk it out in my critique or criticism of it. And what I've tried to do is no matter what I think about, no matter how much I may dislike the sermon, is I still stop and look for what can I take from it that is spiritually beneficial first. That doesn't mean we ignore, it doesn't mean you just turn off all discernment and just listen to preaching and just, Whatever is said, you just accept. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what you first want to do is gather what what was spoken of in regards to the things of God, the word of God, and you put them together and you contemplate them. You converse with yourself about them. You, you, You see what you can learn, what you can take from that. At the same time, you may have to, you know, you still want to talk about the negative things. Well, that was, you know, that was incorrect or I don't know what was going on there, or, or you know, yeah, that that was false doctrine. You, yeah, that's still a, a very important part of pondering and conversing with yourself. I just want you to focus on the positive that you take from God's word first before you offer any criticism. But making the priority, trying to get what you can from God's word and from the preaching of God's word before you just are, start offering critique of it. Because I think sometimes people are like, well, I, I, I listen to sermons and yeah, and then I complain about them for 12 hours. See, I pondered them. No, you just, all you're doing is being like a, you know, a, a critic. Let's, let's listen to God's word and get something positive from it. Then if we have any critique, we can offer the critique. I think that, that puts the, the focus in the right spot first, if that makes some sense. I hope that makes sense. So Sambalo is the idea of, of bringing together you're putting things together and you're conferring with oneself. You're having a conversation with yourself in regards to that. So Mary took everything that was happening. She was putting it together. She was giving it deep, sober consideration. And she was conversing with herself about those things. That is lacking in so many Christians' life. They don't, they don't spend any time doing that. They don't give... That they don't spend much time with God's word, and then the little time they do spend with it, they don't spend any time pondering it. If we don't ponder the things of God, we will simply forget what we've heard and what we've read. And I think we, if we don't ponder the things of God, I think we we stop those things from having a transformative impact in our life 
The lack of pondering God's word leads to a lack of true transformation. If we don't ponder it, we will not be transformed by it. A lack of pondering will lead to a lack of transforming. And the goal when we spend time with God's word is to be transformed by it. Now, and when I say transform, it's just not behavior modification. It's transforming, hopefully, our desires. It's transforming our thinking. It's transforming from an inside out. Sometimes we'll just like, well, as long as I stop a behavior, just remember, just, just modifying the behavior is of a short time value unless you're being changed internally. If the inside doesn't match the outside, then sooner or later, the outside behavior modification will just collapse and will not last. I think part of the issue within the church is a lack of truly pondering God's word. But let's do something else because I didn't even think about this, right? I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 2. But Mary kept kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. I'm going to go to the interlinear. Kept. I, I like that word kept. What is the Greek word for kept, right? Kept is this Greek word. Strong's G, 4933, Suntereo. 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 I can't roll my R's there. Suntereo. Suntereo is used four times. Preserve, absorb, observe, keep. Strong's definition. To keep closely together to conserve uh, uh, from ruin. I like that. To conserve, to conserve from ruin, mentally to remember and obey, keep, observe, preserve. It's to conserve something from ruin, right? So when she kept these things, she was keeping them from being lost. She was keeping these things from ruin. See, when you hear God's word, you can't, before you get to the pondering of it, you have to keep it. You have to grab on to it. You have to, you have to ensure that it's there. You have to ensure that you grab on and you hold on to it so that you're preserving it. You're keeping it so that it will not be lost, so that it will not be ruined, so it will not be destroyed. You can listen to all the preaching in the world. If you don't grab on to it and keep it, well, one, you'll never get to the pondering of it. You will never ponder it because you're going to forget it. But not only that, it's just, in a sense, going to be ruined. It's just going to be wasted. It's it's going to be of of no lasting value. I think a lot of people hear preaching, they don't keep it. They don't keep it. And therefore, they don't ponder upon it. Therefore, they're not transformed by it. It requires two. So to really make this work, We've got to keep it, and we've got to ponder it. We've got to grab on to it. Um, the outline of biblical usage. To preserve a thing from perishing or being lost. To keep with oneself. Keep in mind a thing, lest it be forgotten. This is the preserving of what you've... Now, you can preserve it by notes. Now, one of the things that drives me... <laughs> crazy in many cases. Now in my church, it's pretty, it's pretty common for everyone for the most part to take notes. It's, it's, it, I've tried to just build that into the culture of my church and I've built it into the culture of my church by doing a couple of things. One, I will, I will never have a, a screen which puts the points of my sermons or anything up there. I'm, no, I, I, don't, I want people to listen and then I want people to write. Two, the way I teach. I teach with the, the idea that I will stop and spell a word or I'll repeat. I, I teach you, basically giving you the idea that I want you to write this down uh, I, because I'm trying to get people to write it down because there is a chance, there's a chance that if they hear it, if they write it, they will remember it, which then gives them the ability to ponder it, right? So if they hear it, if they write it, 
that gives them the ability to keep it, then hopefully that will lead them to pondering it. Now, I can't make them ponder it. I can't make them put it all together and converse with themselves about it. I can't force that to happen. But I can teach it in such a way that the implication is kind of like, why are you not writing this down? And I've noticed that sometimes when people who come into my church who are visiting, visitors will kind of look around and start like, oh, I'm supposed to be writing things down. Like, like they almost start like, okay, to, like they'll start looking around for like a pencil or paper or something because they, they, they catch on really quick that I'm teaching. My teaching just gives the idea that if you're not writing it down, you're not participating correctly. I don't want it to be a legalistic thing, but I want it to be, no, what we're doing here is so important that I not only do I want you to hear it, I want you to write it because I want you to remember it so that you can ponder on it, so therefore you can be transformed by it. Mary kept, she kept, she preserved it. She she was trying to conserve it. She was trying to conserve it from ruin. I love that. I love that from Strong's definition. Conserve it from ruin or from the outline of biblical, to preserve a thing from perishing or being lost, to keep within oneself, keep in mind, a thing lest it be forgotten. I want you to consider how many sermons you think you've heard in your Christian life. How many sermons do you think you've heard? I can't even, I can't, I mean, I don't, I could probably try to, I don't even know, actually, I don't even know if I could count how many sermons I've heard in my life. I mean, I really have no, I've heard so much preaching, so much preaching, so much, but I can't even begin to count how much of it I have forgotten, how much of it I did not keep, I did not preserve, I did not conserve from being, from ruin, from being lost. It went in one ear, in a sense, out the other. It's gone, never to be remembered. How many sermons have you, think about it, we're December 25th, how many sermons did you hear in 2021? How many are just gone? I mean, they're gone. You don't have a clue. You don't remember anything. They're just gone. Now, sometimes that can be the preacher's fault. I think that I'll put the blame there because sometimes they don't preach in a way for it to be remembered. I think you have to, I think you have to get out of the, some preachers just want a sermon and I've said that I think there's a big difference between just preaching a sermon where you you check all of the boxes of a good speech, right? You got eye contact, you got voice inflection, you, you, you've got that emotional, you got a good opening introduction, an emotional conclusion. You, you, you put it all together, but it's just a speech. I try to teach in a way that no, 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 we're, we're studying together. So I want you looking things up. I want you writing things down. So I will I will do some of the teaching and then I want people participating. I want, uh, I'm asking people, so, okay, what does that verse say? Okay, hey, guys, we're gonna look at this text. Okay, give me what you think the outline is. Or, or hey, okay, grab a Bible dictionary, look this up. I try to get the people involved in the process because I'm th- my, my theory is that the more they're involved in the process, there's at least a greater chance that they will remember something from it. They may not remember a lot, but maybe they'll remember at least the thing they looked up. So we have Bible dictionaries all over the church. We do everything we can to try to get people involved in the process. That's why I do the Bible study exercise the way I do it. I don't just teach because how many podcasts have you heard? I I, I try to do some of the teachings there. Now, Now, here it is. It's yours. Here you go. Go do the work. Now, guess what? I am very aware that I may have 900 downloads, right? And eight people will participate. I may have a thousand downloads and have two people participating. I understand that what I'm trying to do is not going to be well received by the majority, but I know, I feel that those who participate, they're doing the assignments, they're looking up, they're, they're emailing me their outlines, they're talking about it. I'm a, I'm, I, I would, pro, I, 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 if I was a betting person, I would bet they're the ones who remember it. I bet they're the ones who remember that that part of the Bible study exercise. What I love is when I'll get one of the people participating in the Bible Bible study exercise and we'll be like three, four, five Bible studies, you know, we're, we're three or four or five weeks removed from that old one. And there'll be something in the new Bible study and they'll send notes. They'll send me their notes or their thoughts and they will re- reference something that we did four or five weeks ago. 
showing a possible correlation or connection. I love that because that means they actually remembered what we did four or five weeks ago. You know how utterly amazing that is con- uh, based off all the statistics showing how many people will not remember anything. We have to be like Mary. We've got we've to keep, we've got to grab onto, preserve, conserve, that, that it won't fall into ruin or be lost. We have to grab onto it. And then once we have it, we've got to put it together and converse with ourselves about it. We have to think about it. We have to ponder it. We have to work on it and, and, and really give it great consideration. We have to. So, so I want to give you the two Greek words again, all right? Because I want you to remember the Greek words, right? The first one is the one to keep, that she kept these things. This is this, is this Greek word. Strong's G, 4933, Suntereo. 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 I want you to write down Suntereo. The transliteration is S Y N T E R E O. Suntereo. S Y N T E R E O. Suntereo. I want you to make Suntereo a priority in your Christian life going into 2022, that you grab on to whatever you're studying, you grab on to whatever you learn in a sermon. Suntereo, you grab it. And I will, and I'm gonna, I'm I'm going to be dogmatic about this. If you don't take notes, you're not keeping, you're not grabbing onto anything. Now, some of you may have the ability to hear and never forget. And if you have that ability, thank, thanks, thank God, praise God. That's amazing. But most people have to write it down. And I hate to say this. In many cases, it's women who do the writing things down and not the men. Not There are always exceptions. But we need to get more men with, op- with notebooks in hand, writing down, preserving, keeping those things so they will not go to loss and ruin. Right? We need men who are practicing Sunta Reo. They show up to church, they listen to Bible studies, they listen to podcasts, and they write those things down so that they can remember it, so they can keep it, so they can preserve it, so it will not be lost. Because if you don't keep it, if you don't preserve it, you know what's going to be lost? What's going to be lost is the transforming impact from it. If you don't keep it, it can't transform you. I, I cannot stress this enough. So, so there's suntereo. And then the next word is pondering them in her heart. The Greek word for pondering is this Greek word. And she pondered, and you already know what it is. All right, here we go. Here's the next one. Strong's G, 4820. Sumbalo. 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 Sumbalo is S-Y-M. B A L L O Symbolo S Y M B A L L O Symbolo. We need people practicing Symbolo. Um, someone is actually listening to me live this morning. Okay, Th- thank you. I I really believe nobody was going to be listening to me this morning. Uh, she kept those things in her heart so well. You would assume she was able to give all the details of those days to Luke many years later. Presuming, presumably he interviewed her. Well, that's that's a possibility that maybe part of the way that they the, the writers got the information maybe from Mary. Uh, we, we could look into the possible historical possibility of that. But it, that, that could be very much the case. But whether she was interviewed, whether she get whatever she did with the information, we know from the inspired word of God, she kept them and she pondered them. And I think that's lacking in the life of many Christians. That they, they, We don't keep it, we don't ponder it, and we lose it, all right? I've often said this. I've said this for, I don't know, 20 plus years. It's been a major, it's been a major part of my Christian life. It's just a saying that I say over and over and over. Interpretation without application equals abortion. I did not, I did not originate with me, but it's just a principle that I've, I've stated over and over. So in other words, if I interpret the Bible, but I don't apply the Bible, 
I abort the scriptures from giving birth to any true change in my life. Now, now let's make let's, let's just make sure we get this out of the way. I don't care how much you keep it. I don't care how much you meditate on it. I don't care how much you apply it. That doesn't guarantee that you're going to be sinless, okay? Because we're all going to sin. So it's not about like, well, you studied and you studied and look at the sin you commit. I understand that. I'm saying that the, the only hope of transformation is this. Because remember, the you can interpret, you can apply, you can keep, you can ponder, you still may sin. Hopefully, all of that applying, keeping, pondering will allow that even if you sin, to handle this sin, hopefully in the most biblical way possible, and allow you to get back up and continue to walk in your Christian life. You're not totally destroyed and the end of your Christian life from it. Because a lot, I, I think I was so much taught that, I think that was one of the major issues I had early on in my Christian life, is it was kind of taught to me early on in my Christian life in the Southern Baptist Church was kind of like, if you read your Bible, study your Bible, you won't sin. I, there was a famous, I think it uh, comes from Bob Jones Sr., uh, you know, uh, sin will keep you from God's word or God's word will keep you from sin, that kind of concept. And I, I took that to mean, okay, well, if I study my Bible, I won't sin. That, that's kind of how I took it as a young Christian. And then I realized I kept sinning. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, what in the world? So the, the concept is this. The more we spend time with God's word, keeping it, pondering it, applying it, the greater chance it can produce that change. It can bring tra- be tra- uh, transformative in our life. It can bring transformation. It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless. It just means that hopefully that in our Christian life, when there, that there will be times of victory and even in the times of defeat, we will still handle it the most biblical way possible. That, that's really the goal. I think that's just something that has to be discussed. So I'm going to say it this way. If we don't keep it, if we don't ponder it, then in a sense, we abort it. If we don't keep it, preserve it, we don't keep and preserve it, if we don't do that and we don't ponder it, we don't put it together and converse with ourselves with it, we abort it from it producing any transformation in us. And I think it's something to greatly consider. I think it's something that we have to consider. And, and again, that's one of the reasons I've done the Bible study exercises the way I do them, as I want people actually involved in participating. Now, it's easy. It's one thing to just turn on the microphone and do a little bit of teaching, do a little bit of teaching, but there's millions of those podcasts. So people hear it and then boom, they forget it. They hear it. They forget. I don't, I'm, I, when I, I want to say, stop what you're doing. Let's really consider it. Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Now, what I wanted to do, or I didn't even realize, I'm already at 47 minutes. <laughs> well, okay. We didn't get very far. What I want to get into is a entire discussion on biblical meditation. All right? Biblical meditation. I think sometimes we put such an emphasis on listening to sermons, on studying your Bible, on reading your Bible, but we may not put as much emphasis on truly pondering it or meditating on it. I think sometimes we we forget to do that. In fact, uh, I have an article here on biblical meditation, and let's see here. I think there's they give a definition here. Yeah, what does it mean uh, to meditate? Um. Okay, hang on. They go. They, they don't give an actual good definition here. Uh, meditation means the act of focusing one's thoughts to ponder. There's the word to think on, to muse. Meditation consists of reflective thinking or contemplation, usually on a specific subject, to discern its meaning or its significance or a plan of action. Some synonyms would be contemplation, reflection, rumination, deep thinking, or remembering and the sense of keeping or calling something to mind for the purpose of consideration, reflection, or meditation. Literally, 
that fits perfectly with what we have here in Luke 2, 19. She kept it. She pondered it. She put it together and she conversed with herself about it. Those are That literally is where the idea of, of meditation, you can put all of that together and you really get a good idea of meditation. And I think meditation also involves the concept of, of application because you're considering, you're thinking about it. You're, you're, what are the implications of this? What should I do with this? Now, for me, I tend to, now, I've talked about this before. One of the major impacts of my Christian life is when I would come home from school and I had a notebook and I listened to three preachers. Everybody's heard this story. It was, it was Chuck Swindoll, John MacArthur, and Chuck Smith. MacArthur taught me the importance of exegetical you know, study of God's word, verse by verse, interpretation, make sure, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth. He, he got me the interpretation part. He emphasized that, and I'm so grateful for that, okay? Chuck Swindoll, he taught me the importance of application, 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 application. Now, there are times, I've got a notebook right here to show this, you'll see that sometimes I... I tend to focus more on the interpretation than even sometimes I may do on the application, right? I did a devotional late last night on, in fact, I'll open up my notebook here. Late last night, where is it? Let me go here. Uh, Let's see, there's from my sermon. Where is it? I got to find it. 1 Peter 3.15. Now, I broke that I broke 1 Peter 3:15 down completely, right? And I there's I think I do a very good job of possibly at least putting forth a thesis, a hypothesis that maybe we've miss uh, we've misapplied 1 Peter 3:15. We we've applied it in a way that I don't think it was intended. At some point you'll probably hear teaching on this. All right. But when I really look at it, I do kind of throw out my hypothesis that maybe we got this wrong, but if, if by the time I'm done with this, I don't really do much application. I don't do much application. There are times that I do a lot of interpretation, but, and and sometimes I have a tendency to go, look, man, I broke that verse down. I broke that passage down. I got an outline. I know what that means in the Greek and I know that what that means in the Hebrew. Okay, and I've got it all, uh, I've got all my points, but sometimes I'll go back and look at my notes and go, but I didn't really spend much time meditating on it, pondering it. I didn't spend a lot of time putting it together. I, now I've got it in my notebook, so I did the keeping. I, I did the keeping of it, right? I tried to preserve it. It's it's in my brain, but I didn't spend a, maybe the adequate amount of time of really allowing that scripture to work its way in me, through me, to transform me. Now, sometimes I'm very, sometimes I'm really good at the the, the pondering part, especially when I'm here in the church and it's just me, a notebook and a Bible, and I'll spend, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes just walking around talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. One of the things for me is the Bible study exercises has been very beneficial to me in this way because, one, I, I get everyone sending me their thoughts, which helps, helps. But anytime, and Will is listening, he probably knows this as well, anytime you have to preach it, teach it, or do a podcast about it, the, it really gives you even, it really increases that pondering it, thinking about it. Teaching is one of the greatest helps to me because no matter how much I've interpreted it, once I start preaching it or teaching it or doing a podcast about it, it then I have to really give it even more consideration. And in many cases, it, it, it does even, it gives me, give, puts me in a position for it to do more work in me. A lot of times I do the work Think of it this way. Sometimes, depending on the people listening, some of you may be very good at doing the work on the text, but you cannot forget putting yourself in a position so that the text can work on you. This is one of the greatest dangers of being a preacher. There, one of the benefits is we get to talk about the scriptures. So there, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing, and I think it's, it's, it can be very beneficial. But there's a danger in being a preacher or a teacher. As we do the work on the text, 
There's the text. We work on it, right? We try to interpret it. We try to outline it. We try to break it down. We may even try to apply it. But it, it all becomes us working on the text. And, and, and sometimes that will put me in a position for the text to work on me. But a lot of times when the sermon is over, I will find myself, look, you did all the work on the text. You didn't, you didn't allow the text to work on you, all right? Um, a year of not teaching because of the pandemic sadly took a hit on me spiritually. Yeah, I think I, I've seen it go two ways. I've seen, I've seen where my teaching has been so beneficial, so beneficial, because I get to really think about God's word and it does, it does, you know, it does what it's supposed to do. But I've also seen where my preaching and teaching is me working on the text and I'm not allowing the text to work on me. I, I've, I know I have been, I know I have been greatly guilty of that in times. So I think it's a double-edged sword. And this is just true of any, of any Bible study endeavor. We, we get together to work on the text. We get together to work on the text and we work on it. And we may even quote unquote master it. We conquer it. We understand it, but we've got to let the text master us. We got to let the text conquer us. We've got to let the text work on us. The, the text becomes, I, I, I hate to use this term, but it, it, there's a danger here. There, 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 like there's, there's such a benefit in teaching, but there's a danger in it. And this is just, this danger is true of not, of not even if you don't teach. Anyone who just really cares about Bible study. I have a tendency to see the text as a puzzle, right? And I'm like, oh man, I got all these pieces. I'm going to put this together. I'm going to put this together, right? So I'm sitting at the table and I got my 500 pieces. I'm like, okay, here, put this together. And then when I'm done, I'm like, whoa, look at that. I put it together. Look at that completed picture. Look, everyone, look, everyone, look, everyone. I Look, look, aren't you amazed? Aren't you amazed? I'm amazed. It's amazing. It's amazing. But sometimes I forget that the text is putting the puzzle together of me. It's got to be, the text is supposed to be putting the puzzle together. It's taking all of my broken pieces and putting them together and transforming them. Sometimes I see the text as the thing to master instead of seeing myself as the thing that must be mastered by the text. I'm going to argue we've witnessed a little bit of that. And I know, I know anytime I say this, I'm going to get emails, but just please just, just try to hear what I'm trying to say. We, we were facing a horrible situation with the pandemic. Whatever your feelings are about it, whatever your feelings are about what the governments have done, or, I, I understand there's so much to debate. I understand. But I know that in the midst of trying to figure out what governments should do, shouldn't do, what you agree with, what you disagree with, that one thing that was just looming over all of us was Romans chapter 13. I mean, it was just there yelling at us. And a lot of us, a lot of Christians went to work on Romans 13. They went to work on Romans 13 to make it work for what they wanted to do. But we should never go to work on a text. We should always put ourselves in a position where the text can work on us. All right, I think this is a, I, I think preaching is, 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 is uh, puts you in a great position because you really get to contemplate it and ponder it. And I think it's good, but it's also a danger. And anyone who does Bible study, that you can just take the text and you're doing the work on the text. I know I'm repeating myself, but I really want to drive this point home. We, we, we have to put our, we, the text has got to be the one doing the work. Now it's kind of a it's a circle, right? Yeah, I've got it. I've got the text. I've got to work on it. I've got to put it together. I've got to contemplate it. That that's all about a pondering it. But at some point, after I've done all the work and I think I've got it figured out, I've got to step back and then sit under it and let it do its work on me. Because the goal is not just knowledge; it's transformation. The goal is not just finished the sermon, taught a Sunday school lesson did my devotional time, the goal should be I was completely transformed by it. Maybe Mary, when it comes to everything that happened with Christmas, she so preserved it, she so contemplated it, con she, she pondered it and so spent time contemplating it that it transformed her 
and had its impact on her the way it was supposed to do so. I it I wish I I <laughs> It just bothers me that it doesn't say that about Joseph. It really does. It, it's never really given me much thought, but it kind of bothers me now. Like, where? Joseph, what was Joseph doing here? I know that we can't go there. I know we can't go there because that's speculation, speculation, speculation. So maybe he did. I just wish. Now, Joseph, let's not be too critical of him. He's been very obedient to everything that, you know, God told him to do. He gets this. He's, he's demonstrating, you know, leadership and obedience. He, he has done those things. But it's just, I just wish that it would have said that Joseph and Mary kept and pondered those things. But I think it just demonstrates that people are very different. Some people are very prone to this kind of behavior and some people are not. It just goes against everything in their, their personality and their makeup. We just want to encourage as many people to get to struggle to do these things. Because I, I, do, I do believe that there is a lot of preaching but not a lot of impact. And maybe that's just a, a, a pastor part of me, but I, I drive past church after church after church. On my way here, I drive past so many churches. You know, right, right when I leave my, my uh, housing development, I mean, I'm literally just, what, a half a mile, mile from one of the mega churches in, in Abilene, Texas. You know, the park, a, north, a, a campus on the south side and on the north side. I don't know how many people go to that church. And um, sometimes when when I get ready to leave for church and I have to wait because there's so many cars going down the road, I'm like, I can't even get, I can't even get across the street because there's so many cars going to to Beltway Park. Um, Even closer from that, there's a big Nazarene church. So on on that very street that I live, or where I come out of my housing development, there's two massive churches. And then when I get on the highway, I drive past two churches. just on the highway to get to the turn to, to come down to the church. And then there's another one on that road. So there's, I, I could drive past so many churches and it's like there's churches all over, you know, Abilene. They're everywhere. Church, 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 sermon after sermon after sermon, Bible study after Bible study after Bible study. And you look at the, the city of Abilene, you're like, where is the transformation? I mean, with all of these churches and all of these sermons, now on one hand, we have to expect that there's still going to be sin because we're all sinners. We have a sinful nature. That's never going to go away. But the other side, you're just like, what, what are we really accomplishing? I think we've got to keep God's word. We've got to preserve it. We've got to ponder it. And I think I'm just going to add this concept. We've got to allow it to do its work on us. It's kind of went a completely different direction than I intended, but... I, I I I possibly should have just done this as a Bible study exercise for for our our, our but it it yeah I, now I'm sitting here going I should have just made this another part of our Bible study exercise for Luke chapter two verses one through twenty but I it it works as a standalone as well because I'm going to build on this and we're gonna we're gonna do a whole discussion I I don't know when I'm gonna. I may do it tomorrow. I, I may do it tomorrow for Sunday school now that I'm thinking about it. Um, we're just going to do a little bit of work on, 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 on Christian meditation. Um, well, we'll see. It may, it's going to turn into at least a mini series on Christian meditation because I think it's something we really need to develop the skill of. It's not, a natu- I, it's not natural for everyone. For some people, it is. For, for some people, they have a natural inclination to it. And some people, it goes against everything a part of them. But it's, it's, it's necessary if we're going to accomplish anything. But I'll stop right there. That's already over an hour. That wasn't my intention. It's supposed to be, <laughs> yeah. In my mind, this was going to go a completely different direction. But one of the things I try to do is allow things to just go the direction they go and I don't try to force it. So there you have it. You can give me your thoughts. You can email me, newsifyahoo.com, newsifyahoo.com. That's newsifyahoo.com. I think I'm going to do one more thing before I leave because uh, Thomas Akempis just walked through the door and uh, he wants to talk to everybody. Okay, well, actually, he didn't walk through the door because, you know, he's been dead for 500 plus years. But I've got the imitation of Christ. I just saw it sitting right here. So I think we're going to because, man, I don't know if you heard our discussion on uh, the imitation of Christ yesterday. That was some convicting stuff that I'm still trying to process. 
That was some really good stuff. So I think we're going to just see if we can build on that here in the next few minutes. So I'll be back live on the air here shortly. Thanks for everyone, for anyone who was listening. Everyone have a Merry Christmas. God bless. And uh, we'll be back on the air here shortly. Thanks.